So how did we get here? I don't mean how did we get here from our respective homes, but yesterday, Dr. Aaron mentioned, how did we get to this place in Canada where we are now at a point where we cannot even define what we are in terms of gender, we can't even define the sanctity of life and, and marriage and, and so forth. The Spanish philosopher Santayana once said that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I think it's important for us to understand and ask the question that what we want to do is find out how did we get to this place, this stage in our country's history and in the history of the West. In order to do that, we need to retrace our steps, and that's what we're going to be doing tonight in this session. I want to begin by sharing with you a story, a parable that was written by Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher who declared the death of God at the end of the 19th century. Friedrich Nietzsche was a famous uh, philosopher and atheist, and Nietzsche um, had declared that with the advent of nihilism, which is basically the the view that there is no objective meaning or purpose in the universe, with the coming of the death of God and therefore the destruction of all meaning and purpose, that humans really um, have not, or had not at least, uh, grasped the reality of those conclusions. And so in this story, he, he says this, this was written in 1882, have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I seek God. I seek God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Has he got lost? Asked one. Did he lose his own way like a child? Asked another. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage? Immigrated. Thus they yelled and laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God? He cried. I will tell you. We have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers, but how did we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually, backward, sideward, forward, in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we hear nothing as of yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are bearing God? Do we smell nothing yet of the divine decomposition? God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderer of all murderers. With what shall we wipe this blood off of us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? Here the madman fell silent and looked again at his listeners, and they too were silent and stared at him in astonishment. At last he threw his lantern on the ground and it broke into pieces and he went out. I've come too early, he said to them. My time is not yet. This tremendous event is still on its way still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of men. What, after all, are all these churches now if they are not the tombs and sepulchers of God? And what Nietzsche was trying to argue here was that Western men had not yet fully comprehended the ramifications of the death of God. If God does not exist Even Nietzsche, as an atheist, acknowledged that if there is no basis for morality, then we have basically erased any meaning and purpose in the universe. And what he is saying is, we still live as if there is meaning. We still live as if there's purpose. And and so atheists have to steal from my worldview to make sense out of their worldview, which doesn't give any sense or purpose. And Nietzsche is, is basically saying, you still don't get it. If we kill God we kill ourselves. Man has killed himself. And so I want to talk to you today about this thing we call cultural Marxism, and it's known by other names. You may have heard this term by its other fronts, like multiculturalism, political correctness, tolerance, inclusion, safe sex, 
sensitivity training, post-colonial studies, social justice, diversity, special interest groups, being progressive, equality of outcome, the patriarchy, white privilege, toxic masculinity, and so on and so forth. Where did all this come from? It didn't come out of a vacuum. Well, in order to understand this, we need to go back to this man, Karl Marx. We need to understand what this man proposed as a theory of how government should be run. Well, culture Marxism finds its root ultimately in Karl Marx. And you remember he was the, the one who had written Das Kapital, The Capital, and in his book, he talked about how there were two opposing groups. There was the, the capitalists, the bourgeois, and then you've got the working classes, the trades workers and so forth, called the proletariat. So the working classes were being abused by the, pro, the bourgeois. They were being abused by their capitalist masters who were profiting uh, off these poor workers who were working to the bone so that their capitalist masters can become richer and richer. And what he had argued in his book is that the cause of all oppression, now this is going to become a huge word, think of the word oppression because this is going to pop up. He believed that the cause of all oppression, he argued, was economics, that the working class was being oppressed by the ruling classes, the, the bourgeois, and that the capitalists had taken advantage of these workers who work for them, and he believed that the only solution to overcoming this inequality was by having a revolution, a revolution which would topple the capitalist masters and would bring about a utopian world. Now, the word utopia is basically a world of no class distinctions, everyone is equal, everyone is treated the same. And we need to understand here that Karl Marx presented a rival to the kingdom of God. All human kingdoms have been rivals to the kingdom of God. They've tried to bring about the most equitable government that we could uh, provide that sustains peace in the world and gives people equality and so forth. And so Marx became the prophet of this movement, the communist movement, the communist manifesto. And his Bible was his book. The book that they used was Das Kapital, and the communist party would become the priesthood. And the utopian world of the communists was the rival kingdom of God. They promised a, a time where all people will be free, all people will be equal. In other words, these are human counterfeits of God's kingdom. And as we know, when we look at the history of communism, of course, no communist government has ever brought equality of rights. It never brought uh, freedom of speech. It never brought freedom of expression. On the contrary, these things did nothing but bring oppression. Now, what he predicted was there's going to be some stupendous event that's going to happen that's going to cause the working class to rise up against the capitalists and topple them. So when the First World War came in 1914, um, many Marxists believed that this was the time that the revolution would start, that working people across Europe would overthrow their capitalist overlords and that they would bring about communism. Well, sure enough, 1914 came, there was a war, but to their dismay, rather than millions of people of the working class rising to topple their governments, they all lined up to sign up to conscript for the war, to fight for, for England and to fight for France and to fight for, for what was then the Dominion of Canada and to fight for the respective countries. They weren't rising up against their governments, they were actually fighting for their governments. But something happened in 1917. In 1917, with Vladimir Lenin, Vladimir brought about the Bolshevik Revolution that toppled the Tsar, the Russian Tsar Nicholas was toppled, and the revolution began in 1917 in Europe. To the dismay of Vladimir Lenin, um, he was shocked that many Europeans didn't join with him. In fact, many of them condemned what he did in Russia because of the wholesale destruction and eventually the assassination of Tsar Nicholas and his family. But it's not just with Lenin that we see this problem. Uh, we also notice that there were other communist revolutions in, in China. We had the Chinese Revolution under Mao Zedong. 
where millions of Chinese peasants were just obliterated, slaughtered like cattle, because they would not support Mao's revolution. And Mao brought about Marxist-Leninist government. No freedom of speech, no freedom of expression, just the same way it is in China. When Aaron and I were there, we had to submit our passports to every uh, hotel we went to, and, uh, and the police knew where we were at all times, and they had a tight control on things. And we had to be very careful uh, where we met and so forth, because we were being, some of these gentlemen that we were teaching were being followed by the secret police. And so Mao brought that about into China. And then, of course, we had the Cuban Revolution um, with uh, Fidel Castro in uh, 1959, and Cuba to this day remains a communist country. Now, we also witnessed even today, uh, North Korea is a prime example of, of what happens under communist regimes. For, you know, again, uh, North Korea is the number one country in the world that persecutes Christians. Uh, open doors every year. They have North Korea as the number one country of Christian persecution. Uh, no rights at all uh, that they enjoy there. If you really want to see a modern example of what communism looks like, look at Venezuela today. What was once a glorious, powerful country in South America has today become a country that has been deprived of people are starving, uh, they're lining up just to buy toilet paper like they used to do in Russia and other communist countries. Um, people were starving to the point that they were going into the zoos and, and, and t abducting animals from the zoos uh, just to slaughter them so they can eat meat because they had there's a shortage of meat. They couldn't eat. They're starving. Um, and yet today, Venezuela, the people there are fighting for freedom. Many of them are being killed by the police on the streets. So everywhere we look, everywhere... It has been tried and tested everywhere. Communism has sprung and has spread its tentacles. All it has brought is annihilation, the erosion of freedoms, of human freedoms, and of course, the violation of rights. Now today, you will notice that the worst thing you could be today is a Nazi. Everybody will say, well, if you're against abortion, then you're a Nazi. And Donald Trump has been called a Nazi, even though he moved the the uh, embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, that's a typical Nazi thing to do. And um, they accused him of being a Nazi, even though he's got family members who are Jewish, which just makes no sense. Um, but the moment you oppose anyone, Antifa, their number one slogan, uh, you may have seen this in the news, but an old lady was in Hamilton, and she was going to see uh, um, Bernier speak, one of the, the, the runner-ups, one of the party leaders from the People's Party of Canada, Maxine Bernier, was running for prime minister, um, and this old lady with a walker was crossing the street, and the Antifa thugs, the guys who call themselves anti-fascists, when they're in fact the real fascists, covered with masks, ski masks, and so forth, um, there's this old lady on a walker trying to cross the street, and they're blocking her way, and they're calling her Nazi scum. Now, why is it that the Nazis keep getting this bad rap? Why is it that we hear very little about communism. No one goes, hey, you're a commie. Everyone is, you're a Nazi. Why is it that it's always the Nazis that are the most hated group, or they'll call you Hitler? So, so Trump is a Hitler. They call him Hitler, or this person is Hitler. But they don't call him Marx or Lenin or Mao. They call him Hitler. Well, why is that? Well, China killed 70 million of its people in the revolution. The Soviet Union, 20 plus million people. In the Ukraine, Joseph Stalin killed 5 million people. In Cambodia, Pol Pot killed a third of the Cambodian population. The same has applied everywhere communism has spread. But yet in academia today, who is it that they're always condemning? The Nazis. Now we think of the Holocaust, we think of the six million plus all the other people who died, the Poles and, and, and the Germans who opposed the Reich that Adolf Hitler had brought up. What you find is consistent condemnation of Nazism but then when it comes to the communists and the 100 million plus lives that they killed of their own people, the Russians killed their own people, the Chinese killed their own people. And Hitler was saying, oh, we're going to get rid of the Jews, we're going to get rid of the Slavs, we're going to get rid of the Poles and so forth. But why is it that no one talks about the communists and their destruction of lives, even today in Venezuela, North Korea? And, and why is it that you never hear this condemnation of Stalin? or Mao, or Marx, but always of Hitler. And it's not to say Hitler was a nice guy, he certainly wasn't, but why is it that he is the bad 
poster boy, the default pa- bad poster boy? Well, I think it's pretty obvious why it is that we hear very little about this, and that's because most academic professors today are closet Marxists. They come out of the time of the sexual revolution, and they agree with Marxist philosophy. They agree with it. And most of them, this is why most universities today are the breeding ground of these movements like social justice and cultural Marxism. There's no surprise there. That was deliberate why that even happened. Now, we need to understand these two guys. We need to know something about Antonio Gramsci and George Lukak. These two men abandoned the old Marxist approach. They said, Marx had the right idea, but he tried to fix it by looking at it through economics. And what they argued, these are the guys who became the neo-Marxists. These guys argued that the way we're going to change the West is not by doing it through economics. They said, we need to change it through the culture. The culture has to be changed. And how did they do this? They would subvert the West through two main ways. There's two obstacles in the way that must be removed. Number one, Western culture and values. And number two, the Judeo-Christian roots of that Western culture. Those two things have to be eradicated. Now, they realized that this was going to take time. This is not going to be an overnight uh, a, a work, an, o- an overnight uh, thing that we're going to do here. What they argued was that in order to dismantle Christianity, it's going to take time. They started telling the working classes that the reason why they were infected and the reason why they were suffering is because of Christianity's view of the family. Now, keep that in mind. What is being attacked more than anything else today is the family. There's no surprise here. This has been in the works for about 80 years now. It's coming to to fruition now. It's blooming right now. And so what they said was this. The West has to be de-Christianized. Christianity has to be uprooted. And they said that the main way that this is going to happen is through a march through the academic halls of education. Why do you think most of this thinking is in the universities and colleges? Because these neo-Marxists have planned and said, the way we're going to change culture is through the universities. It's through the academic institutions. What they said about religion was the same thing that Karl Marx said. Karl Marx said, religion is the opium of the people. It's the opiate. It's a drug. It's opium. And why did Karl Marx refer to it as an opium? He said that it's an opium because What it does is it drugs people into thinking that there's another world, that there's a hereafter, that there's another world to be sought. And what he argued was, as long as we have religion in the world, it's going to stunt human growth. We can't have progress if you think, well, this isn't my real home. You know, my real home is, is in heaven. And so what I do here really doesn't matter much. It's the pie in the sky mentality. And so religion is dangerous, according to Marx, because it doesn't, it stunts human growth and progress in society. And therefore, he felt, you got to get rid of this drug. It's, it's creating delusions on people. And so Marx believed that God was simply a projection of our minds. Just like Sigmund Freud, uh, the father of psychoanalysis, he believed that, that God was simply a projection of that perfect father, that perfect father we never had, the, the one who is there to look after us and so forth. And what Marx said was this whole thing has to go. So they believe this. People like Gramsci and Lukács believe by destroying Christianity and the Judeo-Christian principles upon which the West is based, the whole Western world, they said, would inevitably collapse. So here's their, here's their method. Whatever Christianity exalted must be made deplorable. Whatever Christianity said was deplorable, they would exalt. Now think about that. It's the transvaluation of these ideas. And this would be something that they said would be a matter of pride. The subversion of values, as they called it. And then they started putting emphasis on certain oppressed groups. So if you really want to understand what's going on in our world, you need to understand this paradigm. You've got the oppressors, and you've got the oppressed. And there's this paradigm. 
There's the oppressed and the oppressed. Who are the oppressors? Well, Marx said they were the capitalists. The neo-Marxists say the oppressor is white European Christians, the patriarchy, the colonizers. Who are the oppressed? Blacks, women, racial minorities, and people in prison. That's why there's prison reform and calls to better treatment of prisoners and so forth. In other words, what has caused the oppression of the minorities in the world is Christianity and Western European males, white males in particular. They're the problem. And so what are we hearing today? Well, Christianity is a patriarchal religion. White privilege. They take advantage over those who are not white and have a Western background. And so what do we see going on here? Well, this is how they did it. Now, that guy Lukak there on, the, on your right there, he introduced sex education into Hungary's public schools. He was Hungarian. So he introduces sexual education in there, and he knew, he knew that if the West's traditional sexual morals could be destroyed, this would inevitably lead to the destruction of Western culture itself. He spoke of free love. He mocked Christian views of sex and monogamy. He showed graphic sexual images in his classes. He also encouraged rebellion against parents. The family unit, he said, was a Christian concept. Now catch that. The family unit, Lukács said, was a Christian concept and that it had to be dismantled. And with the breakdown in the family, what have we seen in our day? The high rates of divorce and single motherhood. What have we seen? We've seen not only family breakdowns, we've seen an exponential rise in abortion. We have seen that the tragedies that are caused among single uh, uh, parent families, and that's not to diss people who are single parents for for reasons they couldn't control, but I'm talking about people who deliberately are promiscuous, have children out of wedlock, and have all these children. What ends up happening is these children grow up and they repeat the same thing. It's a cycle. It's a vicious cycle. And statistics show over and over and over again that children who come from single parent families have higher rates of juvenile delinquency, higher rates of suicide, and higher rates of gang involved, uh, race, uh, gangster involved uh, violence. And also they have a, a higher rate of uh, drug abuse and so forth. Stats don't lie. They're consistent in this area. And what's interesting about the cultural Marxists is that they are the ones who caused all of this to start with, and in the end, they blame Christianity for it. So today, Dr. Aaron yesterday was talking about how today um, everyone is, is changing the words of, of sin and, 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 and we just make mistakes and the, the idea of victimhood. You'll notice today that when, when things happen, kids are told basically that this isn't your fault. This is your family's fault. This is the church's fault. This is society's fault. And so in the end, no wonder there's a sense of, of entitlement because they feel like they've been hard done by. And the reason why they have these problems is because of society, the government, the church. It's an old story. It goes right back to the Garden of Eden. Remember when, when Adam sinned and Eve sinned and Adam ran off and, they, and she ran off and they hid and, and God said to Adam, what, what's going on? What's up? You know, how did this happen? What did Adam do? Well, the first thing he did was he blamed God. He said, the woman you gave me, she made me eat. And so he points the finger at God, blames God indirectly for giving him the woman that caused him to sin. And then Eve blames the serpent, and on goes the game. So today, it's never me. It, it couldn't be me. It must be him, or her, or the government, or whatever it may be. And then today, we see abortion clinics. Abortion clinics all over the country. We look at Planned Parenthood today, the abortion machine of the United States. Its founder, Margaret Sanger, made the following statement. She, she said that... Slavs and Latins and, and Hebrew immigrants and all of these folks, notice how I referred to them. She referred to them as human weeds. She also went on to say that the most loving thing, the most um, merciful thing that a family unit could do is kill its babies. This is the founder of Planned Parenthood. This is the woman who is praised by Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and many in the Democratic Party. This woman was a eugenicist. In the 1920s, you may not know this, but in the 1920s, they practiced eugenics. 
And do you know where Adolf Hitler got the idea of eugenics from? It didn't start in Germany. He got it from the Americans. He came across the writings of Margaret Sanger and her disciples, and he used her arguments to justify destroying Jews and destroying those that were not part of the Aryan system. And you'll notice that many abortion clinics today, where are they located? They're located in low-income areas, in black areas of the United States, in New York. They kill more black children in New York than white children, and, and more black children are killed in New York in abortion than black people are killed by gun violence. Black lives matter. Do they care? Do lives matter? Do the babies' lives matter? Do black lives matter? No, they don't. Why aren't they outside the abortion clinics in New York? She introduced this into the West. And so with these cultural Marxists, these men who brought about cultural Marxism, they started a school in Germany called the Frankfurt School. They called it the Institute for Social Research. And this institution soon became known just as the Frankfurt School. So these men, Mark Horkmer, Theodore Adorno, Wilhelm Reich, Eric Fromm, and Herbert Marcuse, these are the ones who engineered this whole neo-Marxist view that we see today. So what ends up happening is this. Well, in the 1930s, with the Second World War, Adolf Hitler came to power. Uh, these guys realized they couldn't stick around Germany because Hitler was not too fond of them. So what did they do? They moved to New York City. They went to Columbia University and started teaching at Columbia in the United States. And they taught the same thing. They introduced uh, systems of thought like critical theory. And while they were there, they started teaching things like studies and prejudice. Anyone who believed in traditional Western culture is prejudiced, is racist, sexist, fascist, mentally ill. They had a presumptuous attitude of privilege. Same words we keep hearing today. They started teaching cultural studies, women's studies, aboriginal studies, African-American studies, LGBTQ studies, transgender studies, post-colonial studies. All of these, all of these are oppressed by Western Christianity. And so, they started attacking the person of God. Women were seen as victims of the patriarchy. Christianity was a misogynist, male-centered religion whose God is a male who has male pronouns, who is Lord, King, Master. African Americans were enslaved by the white Christians who worship a white Jesus. And it was the Christian white man, they say, that killed the Native Americans and the, the Aboriginal people. There's this deep-seated anger, anger against the West and against Christianity. But they realized that the academic world was the prime way to spread this ideology, but then they realized that if they wanted to really send their ideology out to the common people, they had to do more. So what did they do? They went to Hollywood. And in Hollywood, they said, we are going to communicate this ideology through what? We're going to communicate this ideology through film and through media and radio. So you go to any movie today, what will you find? The promotion of transgenderism, promotion of same-sex relations, a profanity, the use of the name of Jesus as a swear word. This has been going on for a long time. Uh, shows, sitcoms like Will and Grace that try to sanitize homosexual relations. Many of the shows today, you will notice, having children out of wedlock in Friends, for example, and Jennifer Aniston uh, has a child out of wedlock and she doesn't want a father in the picture. What is this? These are all fruits of cultural Marxism being pumped out in the media. And who keeps hearing this? Who goes to hear this stuff? Our young folks, when they go out to, even the, movie, even the, even, even the Marvel movies are going in this direction. If you saw the Black Panther, the Black Panther, you'll notice there's references in there to the white colonizers and how they came and raped the lands of Africa and so forth. It's all there. The new Batwoman movie that's coming out. She's a lesbian. When the real Batwoman in, in, the, in the DC comics had a crush on Batman, not on Batgirl. Why is this the case? Why is this the case? And yet, this is what we keep hearing. Well, how about this guy? This was the poster boy of most young kids in, in university. Yay, Che Guevara, we're going to have a, a beret with that red star on it, and we're going to wear shirts with his picture on it. 
A lot of, a lot of folks don't realize is this man was a, not only was he a racist, he, he hated black people, as Karl Marx did as well. Karl Marx actually hated two types. He hated blacks and he hated Mexicans. Maybe he had a bad enchilada, I don't know. But uh, Che Guevara, Che Guevara was a, actually a medical doctor. He was a white collar worker. He was a medical doctor who took up the fight um, and joined Castro in, in fighting for the, the revolution in Cuba. And uh, Che Guevara not only was a racist, he also put homosexuals in concentration camps in Cuba. Tell that to your gay friends next time when they see them with a Che Guevara shirt on. He hated homosexuals as well. He thought they should be decimated. And the, the matter of fact is this man was not a freedom fighter. He's portrayed as a freedom fighter, but here's one of his uh, statements. To execute a man, we don't need proof of his guilt. We only need proof that it's necessary to execute him. It's that simple. Evidence doesn't matter. Justice doesn't matter. We just need proof that we need to get him out of the way. And that's what he did. He massacred innocent Cubans who resisted the revolution. But that's not what we're told today. And then Joseph Goebbels, a lie that is told once remains a lie. But then he says, but when it's repeated a thousand times, you can believe it. And that's what Hitler did. And the Nazis, they kept repeating the same lie over and over and over and over again. If you repeat a lie often enough, he said, people will believe it. And you yourself will even come to believe it yourself. And, and, and let's face it, folks, we lie to ourselves. When we're caught in a sin and we're caught and we're guilty, we try to justify our sin. We'll try to lie to ourselves to get us outside of the dilemma. It is the absolute right of the state to supervise the formation of public opinion. Does that sound like Canada today? You betcha. And this was said by a Nazi. The Nazi government was a socialist, a national socialist government. And Mussolini's government in Italy was a fascist government. Fascism and socialism have one thing in common. All the power goes to the state. It's bigger government. That's the democratic plan, by the way, in the United States. All power is to be invested in the government, and the government tells you what you can believe, what you cannot believe, what you can say, and what you cannot say. You saw what happened with Don Cherry? Guilty of thought crime. George Orwell's book, he mentions thought crimes will be punishable. And so, he's shot down. You had a woman on the, the studio who basically referred to white boys as, as, as rude uh, uh, white boys who are rude and, and bossy and bullies and so forth, and she gets a chance to explain herself, and she's being praised as a heroine. Don Cherry never got that chance to explain himself. Why? Because he committed a thought crime. He dared to, in their mind, attack the oppressed, the so-called immigrants and the minorities that I believe to be oppressed. Um, Emma Till, this young boy, 14-year-old kid. 1955, he's down in Mississippi visiting family members, and he goes to a shop to buy some candy, and at that time, of course, there was these strong segregation laws in the United States, and he goes into the shop, and the lady in there later tells her husband that this young 14-year-old kid went in there and then whistled at her, that he, he, made, a, he made a flirtatious uh, expression at her. The child, of course, told his friends, I never did any of that. Well, anyway, she tells her husband, and he joins up with his cousin. They go after this child, and they beat this child to death, and they throw him into a river. Nobody at the time, let's just say it this way. They believed what that woman said, that, that this child had actually flirted with her. Well, when the police found this child's body, the child's body was so unrecognizable because it was in the water for so long that the funeral director said, we cannot have an open casket. And the mother said, no, I want the whole world to see what they did to my baby. So this beautiful child looked like that. And later, many years later, this woman who accused this child admitted on 60 Minutes that she made the whole thing up. Remember that moving movement in the United States, Believe the Woman, when Justice Kavanaugh was being put on trial? And they said, just believe the woman. Well... They believed that woman who said that this child whistled at her, and later she said she never did that. You see what happens when truth is ignored? When justice is no longer the standard? We should just believe someone because of their genitalia. What sense does that make? As if women don't lie. 
as if men don't lie. You see how far this is from all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? There is no one good, no, not one. What about the slave trade? Those nasty Christians, those Brits, those Dutch, and you know, even my ancestors, the Portuguese, and, and the Americans, how dare they go to Africa and take these Africans and take them into slavery? Oh, no one talks about the Islamic slave trade. No one talks about the people that were taken, the 140 million black slaves that were taken by the, by the Muslims, by the Arabs, and they castrated the males and kept the women as concubines. No one talks about this. Why is it always the American slave trade, even though slavery was abolished in the West under William Wilberforce in the UK and Abraham Lincoln in the West in the United States? Why is it that we never hear about the Islamic slave trade, which continues to this day? Slavery is still going on in Libya, in Mauritania, in the Sudan. It still continues. It's part of Islamic law. Why? Because the narrative is it's the white European Christian fault. It's not the minorities. Muslims are seen as minorities. They're oppressed in the cultural Marxist paradigm. And why is it no one talks about the African tribes that enslaved other African tribes? Did you know African tribes made slaves of other tribes, as did the aboriginal peoples of this country? That they massacred their own people here in this country? And they, 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 they now have these land claims. We want to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Mississauga tribe. We are on this land. But where did the aboriginal people come? Were they always here? Or did they migrate from the Bering Strait, as most anthropologists believe? Or were the Vikings here first? Should we acknowledge this as Viking land before we acknowledge it as Aboriginal land? You see how silly this gets? Or is the earth the Lord's and the fullness thereof? Think about that. Well, this Muslim scholar goes on to point out that slavery is part of Islam. And whoever says it's not is not being true to Islam. He says slavery has always been part of Islam and will always be part of Islam. But he's not condemned as a racist. What about the Aboriginal, the Iroquois? Did you know the Iroquois wiped out the Hurons in Canada? The Iroquois tribe wiped out completely the Huron tribe. I thought the noble savage, you know, they didn't do that. It was, it was the Europeans who did this. You see, they're rewriting history. Karl Marx said the first thing, the first order of business is to revise history. What about the Crusades? They get a bad rap. But no one talks about the fact that the Crusades were a 400-year response to the Islamic conquests of Europe and North Africa. Did you know all of North Africa was Christian at one time? Augustine was from North Africa. Tertullian was from North Africa. Athanasius from Alexandria in Egypt. Did you know that, um, that the Middle East was all Christian? Syria, Iran, Iraq were all Christians. Did you know the Muslims went as far as Spain and Portugal? Andalusia? until they got kicked out by Charles Martel and later by other European crusaders. The crusades were called 400 years after the Islamic conquests as a response, because if it wasn't for the crusades, there would be no Martin Luther, no reformation, no John Calvin. There would be none of that. Why? All of Europe would have been Islamicized. There'd be no reformation. And there'd be no Canada and there'd be no United States because there'd be no colonies in the United States to rebel against England because they'd all be Muslim. But you see, we've got to rewrite history. And then there's transgenderism, where this child is now the poster boy of transgenderism. He's a little boy walking around provocatively, dancing in bars while gay men put money into his bathing suit. Here's the wheel of oppression, not the wheel of fortune, the wheel of oppression. And there you'll see how the white folks, the the Protestants, the heterosexuals, those guys are the privileged classes. And the more you move to the right, you see the most oppressed people. Do you notice Muslims are oppressed? What about, what about jihad? Terrorism. Does that sound like oppressor or oppressed? But you see, there's a narrative, folks. If it doesn't fit the narrative, we got to dunk it. What about this? All cultures are equal. We have no right to judge people's cultures. Well, did you know that the, uh, the Aztecs would uh, sacrifice people almost every day to the sun god by taking them up to the top of their pyramids and cutting open their chest and grabbing their heart while it was still beating and offering it to the sun god? You want to live in a culture like that? 
To your right, that from Peru, they found over 140 skeletal remains of children that were ritually slaughtered to appease the god of the sea from sending a hurricane against their country. A hundred, over 140 skeletal remains of children with their skulls cracked. What about the noble savage? I thought the savages were noble. Not until they saw this. You know what this proves? All of us, we've all come short of the glory of God. There is no one good. What about in the Old Testament? Sacrificing children to Moloch. When God told them, you shall not pass your children and daughters, you shall not offer them up in the fire. It's an abomination to the Lord. The Canaanites were doing this. It was a big statue of, of Moloch, a molten statue with a huge va a, 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 a cavity in the stomach, a big hole in the stomach, and the arms were out like this. And as they put the child on its arms, it would roll down into its stomach and be consumed in the fire. And the Greek historian Herodotus said that they would play the drums and play the flutes so loud so they wouldn't hear the shrieks of the children as they were being burned alive. Today, we're doing the same thing. We just call it abortion. You know that in New York City, it's illegal to give a lethal injection to a criminal on death row, but it's not illegal to give a child in the womb a lethal injection. How have we come to this? I mentioned this earlier. The Dalits in India, the most oppressed people, some of them are not even considered human. They do the most menial jobs. They're at the bottom of the caste system. Steven Pinker, an atheist, says universities are becoming the laughing stocks of the, of, uh, sorry, universities are becoming the laughing stocks of, did it say universities? My eyes are, of intolerance, right? And he's an atheist. He says, look, our universities are falling apart. We can't even have free speech anymore. What was considered beautiful art at one time, the Mona Lisa, the Pieta, the works of Van Gogh, that's not considered art. That's just old art. That's, that's the patriarchy. We gotta look at works by Salvador Dali, where Jesus is portrayed there, not as a real human. You could see right through him. You could see the water behind him. Why? Because the real Jesus wasn't a real human. That's Gnosticism, folks. That's not Christianity. But art today is, is beautiful when it's disgusting. So here in the Guggenheim in New York City, they have a toilet there made of pure gold and 100,000 people lined up just to use that toilet. And you know what they call that toilet? The title of that toilet? America. So when you're defecating, you're defecating on America. What about this art? There on the left, you have, this was called art. It appeared in a number of galleries. And on the left there, you have a crucifix in a vial of urine. It's called, and excuse my language, it's called Piss Christ. And that was called art. On the right, you have a picture of the Virgin Mary. And there she is being presented. She's made of elephant dung there. They made that picture with elephant dung. And they call that art. Would they do that with Muhammad, the prophet of Islam? Not if they want to live. How about this? This picture here. The Literature English Department of the University of Pennsylvania replaced a portrait of the greatest English writer Shakespeare with a portrait of a black lesbian poet because Shakespeare was a white European male. Nighttime entertainment used to be about, here's Johnny. He'd come out on the stage and he'd, remember him? Did you hear what the president said? You know, talk like that. And then he'd go, oh, right? Well, now, what's nighttime uh, television all about? Politics, impeachment, Trump, the left, the alt-right. Did you notice? All night entertainment today is no longer about coming home from work from a hard day's work and just having a few laughs with Johnny and Ed McMahon, who always laughs all the time, even before Johnny finishes the joke. But that's what politics have become today. And of course, uh, even in religion, there's, there's Paul Washer, a great man of God, a great preacher. And there on your right is a Lutheran minister of the ECLA the ECLA, or the ELSC, the uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, or as I call it, everything Luther can't affirm. And uh, there you have her in her tattoos. I, if you ever see her preach, uh, she blasphemes the blood of Christ. She mocks Jesus Christ, mocks the Bible. And uh, she uh, actually took all the chastity rings of all the people in her Lutheran church, melted them down. And again, excuse my language, she made a, a large golden shaped vagina, which she then dedicated to Gloria Stein. And freedom of speech, as you know, is out the window. I've got to finish up quickly because my time is up. Freedom of speech, as you know it, in Canada is dying. It's pretty well dead. 
the United States, they want to abolish the Second Amendment. And the issue of race is something that is still being debated. America is the most racist country in the world. Really? You ever been to China or some of these Asian countries, which I've been to? You know what, you know what they call white people in China? Gui Lo, white ghosts. And black people are Hakwe, black ghosts. Isn't that lovely? I'm a white ghost. I'm Casper, the friendly ghost. <laughs> but that's not racist. And then, of course, I end with this. Who could attack the Boy Scouts? They're no longer the Boy Scouts, by the way. They're just called now the Scots. Because we want to neuter everything now. Because there are some girls who identify as boys, and there's boys who identify as girls. And fathers can be mothers, and mothers can be fathers. We are in a linguistic jungle. So what does this all say to us? Folks, we're in big trouble. Our society is falling apart. And why? Because we've abandoned him who is the sole source of morality and goodness. We've abandoned him. We've abandoned his word. And the only answer is the gospel, which says human beings are image bearers of God, made in his image, and his image is defined as male and female, binary sexes, God created in his own image. And the only way out of this madness is to return to him who made us in his image. Return to him who is the source of all goodness and justice and morality, and he is the one hope that sinners have, the Lord Jesus Christ. We need him. We need his gospel. Without him, we are lost. To God alone be the glory. Soli Deo Gloria. Amen.